Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster behind the magical land of Yeld. Now coming back for its second edition, and as of a few days ago, met, met its original funding goal. In the red corner, we have Nick Smith, and in the blue corner, we have Jake Richmond. How you two doing today, man? Uh, pretty good. Thanks for having us. Thank you. For yeah, not bad at all. Braving the hell of time zones. <laughs> so, hey, we get through it. We've, we've got plenty of friends in Europe, so it's something we're used to. Mm -hmm. Uh don't don't I know don't I know it when it comes to time zones? I've <laughs> <laughs> somebody had somebody had asked me, would you have an easier time if I if you moved to Europe? No, because I didn't because knowing my luck, I'd end up getting a bunch of guests who live in the states. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's always how it works. Nobody is ever where you are. <laughs> so it, Murph, Murphy's law would dictate I wouldn't solve the problem. I'd just trade one problem with another, which. Is kind of like it's kind of like saying it's less painful to get kicked in the balls than it is to get punched in the balls. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no matter what, it's a struggle. Trick question because you're still going to be on the gr on the ground in pain. Right. That's right. Balls are balls, after mm -hmm. all. <clears throat> but a tradition around here, aside from all of the drinking, is opening up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me th through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay. Um, I'm a lot older than Nick. Uh, we're, we're brothers, by the way. We're siblings. Um, and so my, my early introductions was I had a friend who got the Heroes Unlimited uh, game the book for his birthday and he really wanted to try it out and i think we were 11 or 12 at the time um so we took turns running it for each other we didn't really understand how to play it or what it was uh we didn't have any experience with role-playing games we were trying we were trying to uh tell stories to each other and make characters and run them through adventures and we kind of figured it out as we went along and then um as the older sibling uh, I brought those ideas home and I tried to um, run games for Nick and our uh, other brother, uh, Will. Yeah, and I think we ended up starting with probably like D&D 3, 3.0. That sounds about right, because I was pretty young mm -hmm. um, when that came out. And then I remember, I think that was my first game, sort of trying to learn how that works. And I got somewhat of a hang of it, but I don't think it was till we played the Star Wars D20 game that I really started getting into like mechanics and understanding how these things worked. Um, not which, that that was which Star Wars the greatest. D20? Oh my this gosh, was... I don't even know. What, it, this would have been around the 3.0, 3.5 era for D&D. Both of them yeah, were this... during that era, so... <clears throat> oh, this was oh, the oh. first one. Uh, this was the one Watsi did before um, I don't know, the saga? Mm -hmm. uh, this was the original one that came out of year or two after third edition D&D. Yeah. I was, I was working at a Wizards of the Coast store at the time, and so we just had piles of these books laying around, so I took one home with me and ran it for my brothers. Yeah, the the first one didn't do, didn't um, pan out all that well. Oh, Saga Edition obviously did much better. Yeah, absolutely. But when someone says Star Wars Z20, it's one of those things that's I always, I always have to clarify. Like when someone says, oh, I started with first edition D&D, &D, and I'm like, okay, that's like five different games, so you're going to be right. more specific. <laughs> sure, right. Yeah, you know, I mean, I wasn't even, I didn't even think that there was another one at that time. I know there's so many different Star Wars role-playing games, and anytime I bring it up, people always refer to whatever that original ones that you used, like a D6 system. That was the, that was the West games. End ones. Yeah. Yes. And I've heard a lot of people talk about that, and I can't tell if it's all just nostalgia or if it was an excellent game or not. I oh, it was tell good. You for it was sure. good. It was good enough for Luke. It was good enough for Lucasfilm to send copies of that book to Timothy Zahn when he was writing the Heir to the Empire oh. trilogy. Well, there you go. And 
stuff like Twi'leks were in Star Wars, but the actual name came from those books. Oh, wow. Huh. So, when it comes to establishing the expanded universe, the D6 RPGs um, deserve just as much credit as, say, the Dark Horse comics. Sure, sure. And I, I enjoyed those games a lot. After uh, Heroes Unlimited, that was the second game uh, we ended up playing. Yeah, um, I mentioned this before we went live, but Heroes Unlimited is probably the is probably the worst supers RPG I've ever run. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Kevin Simbeta, along with a large amount of the of the Palladium system, has been my whipping boy for years. Largely because an easy way to get me triggered is bad navigation in books. Yes, and the fact that the table of contents is full of lies and there's no index is <laughs> enough enough to get a designer's death warrant. <laughs> yeah, it was a difficult book. I don't think as a kid I really understood that because I didn't have any point of comparison at all. Even um, as a grown but, man, it's a difficult book. Oh, yeah, 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 for <laughs> sure. And to me it seemed like this textbook, it is a textbook. It, it, it's a horrible textbook that you have to navigate through in the same way you navigate your math book or something like that. And there's all these treasures buried inside of it. You have to find them. So um, my math book actually has an index. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's something that's bothered me for years with so many games that, um, you know, when they're difficult, when, when they're difficult to navigate, when they present like a textbook, it takes me out of it. And it, and it gives me so much trouble understanding them that I end up just putting the game down and I can't touch it anymore. So I, often Nick has to learn games and then explain them to me. I ended up reviewing <laughs> Traveler 5 not too long ago, and I didn't know that behind the scenes development was a bit of a shit show. I only found that out after I put out that video. But I had compared it to the owner's manual of your car. You know, that book that nobody <laughs> reads? And yes, I'm, in I'm including both of you in that. I know you don't read the owner's manual. No, absolutely no, not. No, you're right. <laughs> oh, or that giant or that giant instruction manual for the TI eight for the TI eighty three that we all had in high school, which we also right. didn't read. Yeah, right. I don't think I read that. I think um, we have a cultural understanding that we're not actually supposed to read those things. Um uh, which which makes me wonder why they waste the damn paper for something that nobody's gonna read. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I stu I studied web usability and Na and bad navigation there is what instilled the whole get proper navigation, otherwise you should be flogged kind of thing. <laughs> oh. Sure, sure. And I can under I can understand it like in like thirty or so years ago when a lot of people didn't know what they were doing. I'm a mm -hmm. little bit less inclined nowadays if if somebody puts out a two hundred and fifty page book that doesn't have an index. Sure. Uh, I'm thinking this is something that should be punishable by by you getting dragged out and and put in stocks while we all throw tomatoes at you. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think one of the weird things about um, you know making your own stuff and being a very 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 small company is that you kind of learn by doing. Uh, so you mm -hmm. have something that you think you're good at, but uh, making a game is not one thing. It's you know twenty things. It's thirty things. Publishing a book like that is so many things. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're really good at one of those things or you're really trying hard at 10 of those things, there's going to be 20 other things that you know nothing about. And you're going to end up missing one or five or 10 of them, uh, no matter mm -hmm. how good your efforts are. And that's if you're making a good effort. If you're just half-assing, you're going to miss more. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to do a second edition of our game is because we missed some of those things the first time. Yeah. Now, yeah. Speaking of speaking of that, let's before we even get to the second edition, how did the idea of do because I had I had first found out about the magical land of Yeld because I was a I was a reader of Modern Medusa, um, ah. and I def and I definitely enjoyed it. And the pro I'm curious about the process from creating a web comic that hints at a fan that hints at a fantasy setting to making a full on TTRPG. That's that is definitely a leap. So uh, the, the it's process. it's about. It's a backwards leap because we did it backwards. We had already been working on our role-playing game for several years at that point. Um, we started... Gosh, I don't know. When, when did we publish our first game? We published uh, Classroom Deathmatch together, I think, in 2006. 
It's 2006 and, sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we were looking for another project to work on. And um, I had gotten a copy of God, what was Emily's game dating game called? Do you remember? Uh, our our friend not shooting the moon. Shooting the moon. Um, that was it. Is it Shooting uh, the Moon? Okay. Yeah. I had gotten a copy of Shooting the Moon from Emily Care Boss, and I was really taken by it. It's just this tiny little role-playing game for two people that's about going on a date. Uh, and it's in this tiny little book, and I thought it would be really cool to do a game that was in a very small book like that. Uh, so Nick and I started talking about it, and we had already had these kind of ideas for a fantasy game. We really liked the... Uh, through the door Narnia style adventures, which you know nowadays we would maybe refer to as an isekai uh, adventures. So we started developing Yeld as this idea that it would be, you know, this little thirty or forty page booklet that we would hand out to people. And you know, we worked on it off and on for several years. We got caught up in other things, and I started doing uh, my comic. I started doing Modest Medusa kind of almost on accident. And because I wasn't really sure what to do with the story, I decided it would connect to Yeld and this role-playing game idea that we had been developing. So it was it was completely backwards. Um, Modest Medusa was built on top of Yeld, uh, and we had already had most of the framework for the role-playing game um, finished and developed, and we had even been playtesting it for a while uh, before I started the comic. Right, that makes... That makes sense. Although it it is kind of funny that you mentioned Yeld being a light fifty page book when first edition is two hundred sixty six pages. Yeah. yeah. Well, we kind of went nuts. I mean, at that point, yeah. <laughs> uh, we had both published a few different games, and they were all in the like thirty to sixty yeah. pages range. I think we were edition. very, yeah, oh, very comfortable making games about that size. Right, um, thirty to fifty pages, thirty to sixty pages. We had done that. A few times at this point um, yeah. and that's a completely different beast right? right and so talking about you know organizing a book and you know making sure it's it's readable um we l had to learn that with yelled in a way that yeah. we had just not really tested before yeah um because we were doing it on a scale we hadn't touched and you know when we we had the framework for yelled which is really very small the basic rules of the game really fit into about 10 to 15 pages. Um, but we kept adding stuff and adding stuff, and we kept saying we're going to stop adding stuff when we feel like it's too much and it's too complicated. But we found that as long as we kept, to us anyway, as long as we kept the front end of it really simple, then the back end could be have as much stuff as we wanted. And so we kind of went nuts, and we kind of added everything we could possibly want. Um, one of the things we kept saying is, wouldn't it be cool, you know, if, we had this wouldn't it be cool if we had this and we couldn't find a reason not to add stuff so just one more thing one more thing, one more thing. um whenever whenever someone says that they've added enough i don't believe them <laughs> <laughs> well i i feel like you know some games you read the first 20 pages of it and you're like okay that's it this game doesn't need it anymore and then you see that it has four more 400 more pages and you think oh that is too much um but other games I was reading, uh, we, we played Lancer campaign last year, and I really, really enjoyed it. Nick ran it. Mm -hmm. And Lancer is, you know, a complicated system. It also has some similarities with Yeld. Um, if, if people have played Lancer before, they'll, they'll see some similarities there. Um, and one of the things I like about Lancer is it's, it's, it's a very complex system. It's a little complicated as well. That's I, If you're in the mood for that, I think that's great. It's not always what I want, but I, I, I really got into it. Um, one of the things I like about Lancer is that once you understand the core rules, which are, you know, expansive, but not that huge, you know, it's a good solid, like what, 40 pages, 45 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, once you understand the core yeah, rules yeah. of it, there's all this extra content. The book is just full of extra stuff. And I love all that extra stuff. I love digging into it. I love getting my fingers into the different traits and the different mech builds and the custom customization of it and um, all the different enemies and the enemies you can build and the enemies that it presents to you for campaigns. Um, that's something I really love in games, and that's very much a um, structure we used in Yeld as well. Mm -hmm. Which is not something we had done with our earlier games. Our earlier games like uh, Tulip Academy and Girl Types Boy and Panty Explosion were just very, very simple and very stripped down. Yeah, I remember, uh, I remember Much more episodic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now... 
with some with some of the games that you had mentioned, obviously Heroes Unlimited is using D, is using D one hundred. Star Wars D twenty mm -hmm. was using well a D twenty, and right. it definitely sounds like you guys jumped around quite a bit when it comes when it came to different systems. But with Yeld, you're going with a D you're going with D six is king. Yes, absolutely. And I think one of one of the th one of the things I'd be curious about is was was D six a die setup that you guys had decided on early on or was it a process of elimination after trying other resolution systems? Was the thing uh, so every time we make like a resolution system for the systems for every one of our games are specifically di designed to play whatever that thing is, right? Like that's a big deal for how we design games. It's like the system should inform what the narrative and themes of the game actually are. Um and so we do that a lot, especially in our old games. Uh, with Yeld, I think Jake, when he originally sort of structured it, he had just used D6s um, as the baseline for that. And a big part of that, I know for us, is that D6s are accessible. Um, mm. You don't need to go buy some special dice. Everybody owns a copy of Yahtzee. Just pull out your Yahtzee dice. You can play the game. Same with using uh, an 8x8 grid for combat in Yeld. Everybody's got a chessboard. Just pull out your chessboard. You can use it. Um, yeah, it was just trying to be accessible, right? And D twenties or D sixes are the most accessible dice you can get. No, that was absolutely it. Um, we, like Nick said, we we try to build our games around. You know, we we decide what the game's about, and then we decide how mechanically we can do this. But one of the big things Yeld was going to be about uh, from the very go was being uh, something you could give to a group of children and say, "Let's try to play it," and that meant. Um, having easy to find and use mechanics or uh, not mechanics um, accessories Component. It, it had to be a six sided dice and i think if i remember right i think i wrote the base mechanics for yield in an afternoon I, I was teaching at the time and i think after class i went to a crap where'd i go that crappy pizza bar. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's there was this uh, pizza bar I went to uh, after class, and I was uh, you know cooling cooling down after a long day as an art teacher, and I scribbled out you know 15 pages of notes that were the system, and I the system did not significantly change after that. Um, I brought them to Nick. Nick, you were how old were you at the time? Oh my gosh, how long ago was this? <laughs> Would have this been 2007, 2008? Yeah, something like that. So, yeah, I would have been, like, 17 or 18. Right. Um, I, I remember um, I, I brought I brought them over to our mother's house, and we sat there, and we kind of worked out, you know, what to do next and how to expand the game. And then, you know, and then for years after that, it was just, you know, quietly going back and forth and working on the system and developing and fleshing it out and inventing new stuff for it, uh, back and forth between the two of us. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> obviously, you're obviously you're using D, you're using D six, but since D sixes can come from a lot of different areas, it gives me it reminds me a little bit of of Year Zero in the sense that it's a D six pool, but where those D sixes come from can be a variety of sources. But unless I'm misreading. And feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, because a lot of systems are cramped up in my head, so there mm -hmm. can be some cro some crossing of the streams, as it were. By sure. the way, folks, don't cross the streams. I'm a professional, <laughs> allegedly. Uh, it is this is a aim high kind of kind of approach with the D sixes. You're aiming for a high sum. Yeah. Yeah, again, we needed it to, we needed the base system to be very simple. So what you do is, if the game master says, I want you to try to climb this tree, what you do is you take your strong core dice, um, and your core dice are your four stats, are strong, tough, smart, and brave. So you take your strong core dice, maybe you have two strong dice, and you look to see if you have any special dice that'll help you, like any climb dice, so maybe you have a climb die. So that's three dice altogether. And then you look at your sword, for example, and your sword gives you an extra strong die while you're holding it. Because, you know, everybody wants to hold their sword while they're climbing a tree. Uh, so that's four <laughs> dice you're going to roll together, and you're going to roll them 
And in the first edition, you were comparing that to the game master's role. And, and yeah, you want to build your die pool and then aim as high as possible. A uh, very simple mechanic. Uh, in our new edition, instead of uh, rolling against the game master, you are rolling against a challenge number determined by the adventure's difficulty and your rank. Mm -hmm. So there, it's so in, instead of everything being contested, you do have um, static difficulty numbers that can be used. Yeah, there are contested rules as well, but those those are end up being between players or between monsters. Mm -hmm. Um, which but by, by the way, since since the um isekai thing was brought up a lot allow me to bring up an old joke that some, that some people really hate when i say john carter is an isekai oh yeah but it is yeah of yeah so so is alice 100%. in wonderland so is inuyasha yeah um alice in yeah. wonderland i'm a i'm a little bit 50 50 on because it's not quite it's it's not quite known how much of that was at was just a really really bad trip Sure. sure, but I, I, I think um, I, I, I think the wish fulfillment of I want to quit out of my world and go to this different world mm -hmm. uh, where I can have an adventure and I can experience the kind of things I like and I can be good at something, even if it's scary and it's weird, is broad enough. And I think that, um, you know, Isekai is not the, pers the, the perfect definition for all these things, but, it, but it's close enough. Mm -hmm. It isn't. I just. I mean, I that's like you, I just like using that because I like giving people who complain about isekais um, as much shit as I can. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Um, I I see all the time. I see people complain that it's a you know it's a genre that's destroying anime, uh, and it's yeah. you know I mean there's a lot of really bad ones out there, but it's also you know it was... it's a genre we've had for cent for decades yeah. or for centuries, and we didn't really have a good name for. it. The, that's what, what I that's thought was always, interesting was that's always the thing that was I just the oh, sorry go ahead that's always the thing that I bring up with this sort of thing is that the the term may be new but the actual storytelling motif is not um, mm -hmm. and as far and as far as far as people saying that it's destroying anime because there's so many there's so many ones take ones taking that that approach um hyper hyperbole in the in the same way that Mark Twain once said that sarcasm is the lowest form of wit, hyperbole is the lowest form of critique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's oh, there's also the there's also the fact that the that a lot of that a lot of people's favorite shows would probably would probably qualify as that. Mm -hmm. And the idea of go, of going into another world is nothing New, is nothing new. Hell, one one could say that it's built on how how you how people viewed um, going into the parts of the forest you're not supposed to in every fairy tale we all read as kids. Oh yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like the Lord of the Rings is um, this is gonna sound weird is has some pseudo isekai elements because Frodo very much grows up on the idea of this broader world that he is desperate to visit. That he really wants to get out into the into the world and see, and he has to abandon his old life to go there. Well, um, and I, you're not far off. Cause... Yeah, well, it's not. I'm not. I'm not right either. But I think there's elements there. Well, the reason why I say you're not far off is Tolkien kind of intended for Middle Earth to be th to be this ancient history of what would become our world. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm vastly simplifying it because trying to get deep into um, deep into things like the unfinished tales or Tolkien's letters or the like, I do not have enough alcohol right now to <laughs> dive back into that rabbit hole again. I did my time years ago. I'm not doing it again. Sure. Uh, and I refuse to be sober if I have to do it again. <laughs> right. But you know, I'm no I'm no stranger to th to this idea of care of kids going into this fa going into this fantasy setting and um get and having adventures within it but mm -hmm. a lot of the mm -hmm. a lot of the ones that I have seen and one and one of the big examples I'd say even though it's not the same tone here would be grim back in the mid 2000s which coincidentally also used the d6 system go figure I don't know if I'm familiar with that Grim I'm, I'm was, what was one of fantasy flight games' attempts to jump into the TTRPG space um, okay. alongside Fireborn and some of the 
um, D20 stuff because this was the time of the D20 bubble and everybody was mm -hmm. doing D20. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure I was doing some, something D20 and I never touched any third, I never tried to do any third party D20 stuff, but something out there has my name on it. Oh but, yeah, there's there's a lot of um, D20 splat books that I did art for during that time. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the but the key th the key thing is this one has a, has a full on class system, which is something that yeah. a lot of the a lot of games in that particular sub sub genre, if that's even a word, don't mm -hmm. have. And I am curious what prompted the idea of doing this extensive class system that you guys have. I mean, so Yeld's, I, I don't know if it's, it, if it's the biggest influence, but Yeld is heavily influenced by video games. Uh, yeah. Stuff we were playing together uh, when we were kids, Secret of Man and Legend of Zelda, um, the Final Fantasy games. And so we ended up representing that a lot in Yeld. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. Um, both mechanically and like within like the lore and themes of the game. Um, to down to the structure, which is, you know, hunting down seven bosses and going to their temples and and, and fighting through it. Um, yeah. You know, classic Zelda setup. Yeah, to go even further than that, um, Nick and I didn't come up playing Dungeons & Dragons. We came up playing video games, you know, like everybody our age. Uh, but specifically, we were uh, I was playing a lot of JRPGs. I was playing Dragon Warrior and The Legend of Zelda and uh, Final Fantasy and Final Fantasy Tactics specifically. So when mm -hmm. we started writing this, uh, one of the first things I thought was, well, when I, when I started playing uh, role-playing games, I was always disappointed that they didn't seem to play like I wanted them to play, which they didn't play like Final Fantasy. And so we wrote yelled to be like Final Fantasy, specifically like Final Fantasy Tactics, which meant a lot of jobs and a lot of job variations and a full job system where you're switching your jobs uh, fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. That was always a goal. Which, given given that, I'd I'd like to go through go through some of the go through some of the jobs and some some of the influences. There's a few that I'm going to be skipping just because it's so blazingly obvious. <laughs> right. Like I'm not uh, gonna. Sure. A, I'm not gonna ask you what inspired the Black Mage because it's in the damn name. Right. Oh yeah. But would it be fair to say that free that um, freelancer is meant to be the ja the jack of many trades? What or what one of my one of my students calls the class for indecisive people. <laughs> uh, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Um, and it also helps if Freelancer was a classic Final Fantasy job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it was though. Um, it what it was the more it was meant to be the advanced full freeform affair when it showed up in mm -hmm. like five. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, absolutely, and that's that's what we tried to emulate. Mm -hmm. But would it be fair to say that the Oathbreaker, for instance, is meant to be analogous to a paladin? in some ways i think there's some themes there that are really like tie in well with paladin but oathbreaker is also just like kind of our barbarian stand-in if we're using that kind of like classic D, &D classes terminology yeah um, i think it fits, kind of... it fits several different categories they're, they're also kind of a warrior or a fighter right mm -hmm. yeah we don't um we didn't make any attempt to try to align ourselves to traditional dungeons and dragons categories so we don't really have a paladin we don't really have a fighter, and we don't really yeah. have a barbarian. I'm, but Oathbreaker kind of captures all of that. I mainly said that because of the oh, because of the whole oath oath to the old king, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and and being the and the and the whole being the kind of the kind of the I was going to say man of the people, but I don't think that's appropriate. No, but I, I mean, I, I think you are right. Um, the Oathbreaker is very much tied up in this idea of rebellion, that they are part of an older order that had to rebel against the current prince because he's evil. Mm -hmm. And the original and sort of the... of Oathbreaker was much simpler, and then Nick came in later and rewrote it and added the oaths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I really liked the idea that they were sort of reclaiming this thing that they had been called, right? The kingdom calls them Oathbreakers, the branding of this thing that's meant to like strike fear and sort of like create disruption. 
And the Oathbreaker comes in and they're like, yes, I break oaths because sometimes that's what you have to do because I'm trying to do the right thing, right? I, um, I suppose. And so there's some interesting mechanics there. Mm -hmm. I suppose it'd be better to call him a crusader. I can see that as well. Sure, we were trying to avoid anything that felt like it could be have like a religious context to our world. Um, Yell doesn't really have religions necessarily. Um, there are gods and there are older concepts of like worship, but there's not, not a lot of stuff like that. Um, it's, it's so terminology topics, like that ended up being kind of pushed to the side. Yeah, it's one of the topics we wanted to avoid because, of course, the game is meant to be playable for younger yeah. players. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just speaking in broad, in broad strokes. And Oh, yeah. Totally. Yeah. <clears throat> when it comes to the sh the um shepherd um i suppose i suppose i suppose it could i suppose it could be the case of i of um i will beat you with the power of friendship and this bow and this bow i found mm -hmm. right. yeah. yeah i mean yeah. i i think shepherd is definitely for players who want you know they want a cute animal right they're not necessarily as into to being combat heavy themselves, but they've got this cute pet that will protect them and protect the friends. Mm -hmm. um, that was definitely sort of the shepherd theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also wanted something. I don't remember what game I played as a kid, but there was definitely a JRPG where you had a very mundane job. Uh, something. Like, yeah, there's always uh, something like peasant or pilgrim or something. Yeah, but it, but that ended up being awesome, and we we like the idea that. You know, something like Shepherd could be very important to this culture as the people who protect the cities and the roads between the cities. Mm -hmm. um, and so, even though it's one of the things uh, that happens constantly whenever we talk to people about the game for the first time, they go, Oh, Shepherds seem kind of lame. And we're like, Well, Shepherds are awesome. You, you don't know what you're talking they about. Really let are. us show you. <laughs> uh, let, saying let that us show is you lame how... is like, is like, say, is like saying that nobody plays as Dan in Street Fighter. And then, the, and then. Imagine the shame when when a Dan player ends up ends up showing up to the arcade and kicking your ass. Uh huh. Uh huh. Exactly. Or exactly. in my case, because we played a lot of Gundam games, there I will always I will always rub it in when some when somebody gets their ass kicked by me while I'm playing as a ball. Oh well, yeah, of course. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh the shame. Because mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I do not believe in hitting a man while he's down. I believe in kicking him because that's easier. Sure. Well, you can't <laughs> kick anything with a ball, though. <laughs> but the soul thief. Would it be fair of me to say that that it that um. It obviously there's the thief thing, but it's more it is more combat related than um st than the typical thief skill approach. Yes. Uh, the soul assassin. Yeah. The only thing the soul thief steals is people's lives. Um, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, if we're talking in D and D terms, they, they they take the part of the rogue kit that is all about stealth. Um, but really, they are they are a killer. They are an assassin. Um, they are more than any other job. Um, their role is about uh, murder, which is um, difficult. It, it, we we try to present that as a difficult thing, where like you're playing children, and one of these children is murder because that's the job they try to take. And that gets to weigh heavy on them, and we, we think that's neat narratively. But you know, one of the reasons we provide eight different jobs is because you know not every group wants to have the murder kid, uh, in right, their, in their party. Well, and specifically, we have a lot of mechanics built around the idea that, like, yes, it's a game about fighting. Yes, it's a game about having to fight monsters. Um, but you don't have to kill monsters, and not every monster is like a mindless, bloodthirsty creature. A lot of monsters are just people. Um, they have jobs or they're trying to do whatever they're doing. And so we introduce a lot of stuff that's like, this is how you defeat stuff without killing it. Um, the soul thief is specifically the opposite of that. The soul thief is no, you murder everything. Uh, this is a dangerous world and this is how you survive it. Yeah. An assassin. Yes. yes. And the people, and the people <laughs> of Yell know that you're an assassin. They know historically that soul thieves were killers. When you need, when you need somebody removed, you go to a soul thief when you're, um, town mayor is being oppressive and is overtaxing people you go to the soul thieves mm -hmm. uh, and i know i know some might i know some might say that's pushing it but let's not forget the assassins guild in disc world is a uh, fairly respectable organization yeah i mean they they even have um i, don't, I forget the lord's name but he's on the he's on the city council 
Mm -hmm. Now, granted, yeah, there's yeah. some people who are who take it a little bit far, like say Taya Taime, uh, but then, but then again, but then again, there's there's oh, there's also all the weirdness that happens in the Discworld universe, up sure. to and include and including um, knobs, aka Nobby knobs. You know, mm -hmm. right. the man who is so ugly that he has government documentation to show that he's human. He's a human, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, Discworld is another um, is another influence, at least for me. Oh, I don't for know. sure. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. abs the absurdity of, of, of Discworld is definitely something yeah. that we try and strive for and yell. Yeah. I, I haven't read as many Discworld books, but I've certainly read a few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and we, it's something we, you know, we try for this kind of... Um, combination of uh comedy and uh drama and you know we can lean one way and have the game and the story be very dramatic and then we can swing hard the other way and have it be very goofy yeah and childlike um and yeah, I, I think sometimes there's, there's, that puts people off but well there's definitely two views of yelled uh there's the view that is sort of represented by like how the children see the world mm -hmm. and they sort of make sense of the silly and strange and dangerous parts of it by giving it silly names or kind of tying silly ideas to it. And then there's the actual reality of Yeld, which is this scary fantasy land mm. uh, controlled by, you know, an evil vampire who's trying to uh, destroy it. Yeah. Right. Um, so the, that does sort of exist. And you see that in the writing of Yeld and how we present things. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah. And it is funny that you bring up um, Final Fantasy because of the whole concept of job trainers and the, Essentially, mastery quests to lead into more advanced mm -hmm. um, classes, kind of, kind of right. like how in the original FF you had the whole getting the rat tail for Bahamut to get the advanced right. classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and that's something I loved as a kid. I spent endless hours trying to, you know, figure out how to unlock new jobs and you know, new advanced classes. And in Final Fantasy Tactics, you know, moving from job to job and collecting different skills from different jobs that and finding the best combinations. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's something we really wanted to replicate in the eld yeah cuz e even though the even though some of the base jobs could ha could have some association with um uh, with with um cl with the classics the advanced jobs that's not exactly the case there's not as strong of parallels for them i think that's true uh, yeah we tried i mean there's some obvious ones uh, but we tried to really uh, depart with the advanced jobs. Was, and so each advanced job is centered on something very specific to Yeld, uh, both mechanically and narratively. Mm -hmm. um, vampire Hunter, for example, is, you know, kind of a generic job. A lot of games have vampire hunters. But because Yeld is ruled by vampires, and vampires are part of society, uh, it, it becomes a very important job in Yeld, uh, both socially and uh, mechanically. Yeah. But... One of the one of the other things to note is the is the fact that magic can certainly be powerful, can certainly be reliable, but there's always a, there's always a gamble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I I believe it's a case of when you're when you're rolling, if at any time you start you start getting snake eyes, even if that roll succeeds, then a backfire occurs. Yes, uh, one of the things we always like to say, and this is a big part of our design philosophy, is that. Everything is more fun when things are going wrong. Um, the bigger the disaster, the more fun we're going to have. And so we created something called the Magical Disaster Table. And so when you're casting a spell, just as you said, uh, if you roll a bunch of ones, more than one, uh, you get to roll the Magical Disaster Table and something cool is going to happen. Maybe that will completely disrupt what you're trying to do. Maybe it'll help you out. Uh, possibly it's completely random. Um, and we think that's a lot of fun. It adds an element of danger and excitement to spell casting. It also happens a lot because, you know, a lot of spells are being thrown around. Um, about a third of our jobs can cast spells and monsters can always cast spells if you build them that way. So there's a lot of opportunity for things to blow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because of it's the dice system where you're growing a pool of dice, um, the better you are at casting spells, the more likely you're going to have a disaster. Um, uh, to, to the point where it's almost inevitable. Yeah, and that's just how it works. Um, that's sort of part of Yelp's magic, is you get too good at it, and it's a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, with with all of that said, going for, going from 1st edition to 2nd edition, what were, 
what were some of the thi- what were some of the things that you fe- that you felt a second edition would need to improve upon or adju- or adjust or ev- or even just simply address? Well, I think we mostly just wanted to sell people a second book. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we're, I'm joking, of course. No, there's um, a lot of stuff. Um, well, so yeah. the so we didn't actually originally plan to do a second edition right away. We had planned to produce a second core rule book that was a complement to the first one that was focused more on running games um, and sort of later rank adventures and more stuff to do with monsters and monster jobs because eventually every player has to become a monster. Um, That was our focus. We were working on that and we were realizing that there was so many improvements we were making to like the terminology we're using and we were cleaning things up in the new book and we realized that the best thing we could do it's just go ahead, go back, put out a second edition that uses a bunch of this new stuff we've come up with, um, this new language, this new terminology, just this new um, set of rules that we believe are a little bit cleaner, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we backtracked, started to, to, to work on second edition, and now we've got that coming out to the next year where we plan on putting out the uh, our second actual core book. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like Nick said, we didn't plan on doing a second edition. We like our game. We, we think it's good. Um, we were, we're, we're, we're very proud of it. We like showing it off to people. Um, and so when we, we decided we needed to make changes, uh, the biggest change to our second edition is hundreds of tiny quality of life changes that probably most players won't even notice. Tiny little things, like Nick said, about the way rules are worded or how different things interact or how different pieces fit together that just make the game smoother and easier to play and easier to understand. And we all we already thought the game was pretty smooth and easy to understand, but this just goes so much further. Um, and, and it was nice to be able to go back and uh, do that. Um, because we've been constantly developing content for Yelp, we put out new expansions every few months. Um, it was, we've learned a lot as we've uh, done that. We've uh, learned a lot of different ways to manipulate our system to make small interesting changes and we've also gotten a ton of feedback from people who play the game so um when we decided to actually dive into doing a second edition we saw that there was so much we could change without actually changing the game uh if somebody's played yelled before they're going to be able to walk right into second edition Mm -hmm. and the game's going to be familiar they're going to know how to play it but they're going to see that it's um, easier now, simpler now, clearer now, and there's a bunch of new cool options that they didn't have. Mm-hmm. I think we're both much more aware of the identity of Yeld now. Um, yeah. We've had so much time to sort of grow it and create the world, and there's so much history there now um, mm-hmm. that it would just be a shame not to actually take the opportunity to do this. I'll tell you what, the other really big thing that changed is that our original approach for Yeld is that we were going to have this very basic idea that you are children who travel to a magical land and stuff. And beyond that, we didn't have a lot of lore. We had um, internal lore, uh, and you see a lot of that play out in Modest Medusa, my comic, but we didn't want to box players in. We wanted them to make Yeld their own. We wanted them to take that framework and come in and do whatever they wanted. And we always told people, people would ask us questions. They would say, but really, who is the Vampire Prince? Or what is the Arsenal of Winter? Which are things that feature heavily in in the game that we talk about, but we don't reveal the answers. And we would always say, it's whatever you want it to be. Um, But more and more people would ask us for that. So in second edition and over the last few years and other expansions, we've started to create more lore. We've started to codify more lore. We've started to try to thread a line between um, showing people more and giving people more story elements without taking away their agency to create their own stuff. And because of that, the new edition just has a lot more lore and explains a lot more about the world. And uh, we're hoping that's something that people will like. And that and just, I mean, taking the opportunity to clean up, just editing stuff. Oh my you gosh, know? yeah, typos. Um, <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. I mean, just taking an opportunity to present uh, a cleaner product. Yeah. Yeah, earlier when I was talking about how, you know, when you're doing a book yourself, there's going to be stuff you're not good at. And um, we tried really hard with the first Yelled book to uh, find every single typo. And when we released it, we thought we had. And, you know, Several years later, people will still contact us and be like, dude, you know there's a typo on this page. 
and they're right. <laughs> they, and that's yeah. um, that you know that's that's embarrassing. Um, you, you do your best, but there's always going to be something you miss. And so you know, with the new edition, we're excited to get rid of all those typos, but we're going to leave a few in for people who really like finding them. Oh yeah, yeah, because you know, there's people who. I think buy books just so they can find the typos and point them out to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I can, I can, I can certainly get behind that. Now with that, with that in mind, do you plan on putting in a bit, even if it's just like a one page thing, a conversion guide for people bringing stuff in from first to um, second? Uh, what we're going to have, we're not, not in the book. We're going to have a free PDF that's going to walk you through it. But also, um, what we think people are going to find is it's not going to be super necessary. We think um, what's going to happen is people are going to get their hands on the new rules and they're going to say, oh, this makes perfect sense. Uh, we have to make a few adjustments, but it's common sense stuff. But we're going to have, we're going to have a free PDF that we'll direct people to uh, that will help them out with that. And we all, we've already released, uh, a set of patch notes, which explain in broader details, all the changes we're making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, um, that makes sense. I was working at the wizards of the coast store that I used to work at when third edition dungeons and dragons was released. And we had this handy little, um, brochure we handed out to people. Uh, when they bought the new book or when they were interested that said, um, hey, here's all the changes between, you know, the last version of D&D &D and the new version of D&D. &D. And um, that was a great sales tool and that worked really well. So I'm a big believer in that. Uh, and we're going to be talking about that um, with our fan base and, you know, directing them to the PDF we're offering. Because I think that's necessary even when you have a product that's pretty self-explanatory that people are going to get pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can, I can, cer I can certainly get that. Yeah, we we also have to be careful because it's, and I, I'm sure you know, this, but it's very easy to think our rules are self-explanatory and everybody's going to understand them, and we did a really good job of explaining them, and then that's not always true. Uh, you, people, you can never make something idiot-proof. No, and, right. you know, 100%. we tried really hard in our first book. Um, you know, we, we have comics that we use to explain stuff. We use tons of examples. We try to, we try to write in a style that we think is really accessible, but you know, people come from different experiences. They come from different games. And especially when you start with a game and I am a big believer in, this. if you start with a game, whether that's, um, Dungeons and Dragons or for me, Heroes Unlimited or, you know, uh, the Western game, Star Wars or whatever, that game is ingrained in your role playing experience. And it's really hard to overcome that. It's really hard, you know, to start with Dungeons and Dragons and to go to another system and not see it through the context of Dungeons and Dragons. And you're always mm -hmm. going to say, you know, uh, you're always going to be saying, uh, so something that happens with us a lot is people will say, when do you make your crit roll? And we're like, there's no crit rolls. Or, um, you know, the, people bring uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff to our game and expect it to be there, which is fine. It's not there, and that confuses people. So, um, similarly, when we are um, doing this new edition of the game, uh, no matter how well we think we explain it, there's always going to be people who say, uh, you know, I don't get this. So, you know, we, we have to uh, give them a guide. We have to give them tools to understand that. And, and you know, a PDF that explains the game and explains the changes, I think is really going to help. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We've been, I mean, a lot of these small changes we've made to language ended up being implemented in the expansions we put out in the last year. Um, so several of them already have expressed a lot of the changes that are in second edition. Some of them don't, and we'll probably end up going back, cleaning those up a bit so they match that new language. Yeah. Um, but, but there's the nothing last... in there that's going to feel so confusing that they don't, these two editions don't attach to each other. Mm -hmm. um, I what... don't think there's an instance where that's going to be a huge problem. No, what I do expect to happen is, um, you know, sometimes people won't miss a change right away. And, uh, for example, um, one of the main mechanics of our game, of our game's combat system is called the action chain. And uh, you might remember this. But where, um, during a fight, if I take a successful action, I can choose uh, Nick to go next. And if Nick, uh, and, and then Nick will get an extra die for his action. And then Nick can choose somebody else in our party to go after him. And that person will get two extra dice uh, building the action chain of so-and-so. Uh, and we changed that mechanic slightly so that um, 
those extra dice aren't just applied to your attacks, but they're applied to defense rolls you make later in the turn as well. So if a monster attacks you later in the turn, you're going to add your action chain bonus to defend against the attack. Um, and, you know, we try to explain that in, in the new book, and we provide examples. And if people, are, if people look at that section, they will definitely see it. But if you're coming into the new game, and uh, you might say, um, I already know how the action chain works. I'm not even going to go into that section. So, you know, we expect that there will be things that people miss on the first uh, go through. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to do our best to point those out to people. Oh, yeah, I can certainly get that. Yeah. Now, what are, what would you what would you say would would be the page count you guys are shooting for? Is it going to be around the same as this as first edition or do you think the page count is going to be different for this one? Oh, uh, we uh, are you I know, think... we when we re originally went into to second edition, we we're like, okay, let's try and keep a similar page count. And then yeah. as we decided to say, you know, okay, we want to express a little bit more of the lore and expand on that a bit and redesign the monster formula for designing your own monsters because that needs to be more clean. And then I think inevitably we ended it up with a hundred more pages on top of that. Yeah, we are cleanly at 350 pages and it might be a little more than that. Um, and And... I think I think I think that may sound like it's a bunch of bloat, uh, but in fact, it's a combination of we added a bunch of new content, we added a bunch of new lore. Um, like, like for example, content-wise, there's several new jobs. There's uh, two new advanced jobs and three new monster jobs in the book now. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, part of it is um, I did all the layout for the first book myself, and I'm not a layout person. Uh, and so the first book is a little crammed and it doesn't look great, uh, in some ways. Uh, and, but I've learned a lot about layout since then. And, um, what I didn't learn is that we should hire somebody else to do it. I'm still doing it this time. Uh, but we've learned a lot. And because of that, we're spreading out the book a little bit and giving, uh, giving the text and the images a little more room to breathe and a little more room to be organized. So that eats up some of the pages as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, make, that makes sense. We're going hardcover this time. Oh, it's also uh, a hardcover book. Which will be which, wonderful. Yeah, which doesn't add to the page count, but it makes the book heavier, so... Yeah. Know. I mean, I, I think once we hit after, you know, 300 or some odd pages, not having hardcover, no, um, yeah, it's just a death sense. sentence for that poor book. Yeah, we the first book should have been a hardcover, in hindsight. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly see that. Now, yeah. what would you be shooting for as far as a, pay, as far as a release window? Not a date, oh. but a ballpark. Okay, well, that's something we can be really uh, pretty firm about. We, um, before we, when we did the first Yelp book, we were pretty sure we were um, almost done with it when we did the, our Kickstarter for it, and then it took us another year and a half. Uh, this time, we made sure that we were more or less finished. Uh, so right now, we're um, cleaning up some of the text, and I'm doing the last bit of art, we are planning on delivering our book to the, our printer in uh, late March. And right now the estimate is that we'll have books back in late July. So we're going to be shipping, if everything goes well, which it does not always, uh, we are going to be shipping books in August and September. And they should be available through our distributors, you know, Indie Press Revolution, um, by September. That's our goal. Um, certainly, if things go wrong, it might be uh, we our release might be pushed back into um, the fall. I don't think there's any way, short of one of us passing away or losing a limb or something, that uh, the book won't ship this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we are so over prepared for this right now. Yeah, we have plans for the next few years, so we yeah. want to keep a schedule. Yeah, we we we, we don't want this book to. Drop. Um, and, uh, we are, we are more done. We're not done with this book, but we're more done with it than any project we've ever announced. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and we're excited to get it out. Uh, so that's, that's for the physical book, the PDFs we should be releasing in, uh, what's, what's the month after March, April. We'll, we'll be out in April. Yeah. I think, I think I can say that with like 99 percent confidence mm -hmm. yeah i can and i will i will certainly be 
look be looking forward to it. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy <laughs> the madness that happens here. Sure. Uh, thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often oh, say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, th thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I would love to come back, and I would love to come back with a drink in here. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>